Welcome to uh, today's uh, masterclass uh, hosted jointly by the uh, UK Commission for Employment and Skills and the Centre for Learning and Life Chances in Knowledge Economies and Society, or LAKES, to give it the, uh, the easier to remember title. Um, and uh, these masterclasses uh, we, have reg we hold regularly and uh, to uh, bring in leading thinkers on different issues. Uh, as we uh, come into the months ahead, we've uh, got a programme starting today which is uh, looking a lot on productivity, which is obviously a, a big issue for a lot of us involved in this area, including many of you uh, come here today. And uh, today we're uh, uh, honoured to have uh, Dr. Martin Wheel as our speaker. Uh, uh, Martin's um, been a, a well-known uh, uh, figure on the uh, UK economic policy scene for quite some time, having been uh, <coughs> director at NISA uh, for 15 years and then at the Bank of England Monetary Policy Committee since 2010. And he's going to talk to us today about uh, some different perspectives uh, and looking at the evidence on some of the uh, uh, puzzling questions about the slowdown in productivity that we've seen since the uh, onset of the recession. And so uh, uh, rather than uh, listening to me for too much longer, I'll uh, hand you over to Martin to uh, hear what he's got to say. But uh, 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 after he's spoken, we'll have some questions, but they will be off the record reflecting uh, Martin's role on the Monetary Policy Committee. Well, thank you very much. Uh, the you know, issue of slow productivity growth in Britain is something that I must say to someone of my age feels depressingly familiar. I remember as an undergraduate in 1975 going to a lecture where the lecturer said that uh, no, Britain has had a productivity problem for the last hundred years, lots of policies have been tried, and none of them really have worked. So, no, I mean, you believe things that your lecturers tell you. That's the sort of background that uh, I have always carried with me when I think about the productivity problem. But, uh, sorry, I'm now thinking I should have perhaps done the slides in a different order. The productivity puzzle is shown on this graph, that not only from 2000 until you know, the start of the financial crisis until two, in 2008, but actually going quite a lot further back, labour productivity, the output produced per hour worked in Britain had grown at something like 2% a year. And certainly that was something that people took as you know, a fairly fixed parameter of the British economy. When I say that <coughs> no, Britain had had a productivity problem, lots of things had been tried and none of them had worked, in the 1950s and 1960s this sort of growth rate was disappointing compared with the productivity growth rates that France and Germany and subsequently, no, and Japan delivered, though in France and Germany of the order of 4 to 5 percent, in Japan, no, something even faster, as far as I remember, more than 6 or 7 percent. So British productivity growth was disappointing, but uh, nevertheless, it was a fairly steady feature of the economy. In 2008, we had the banking crisis, and these data, which go up to the beginning of this year, suggest that uh, productivity more or less hasn't grown at all since the start of 2008. Now, the latest figures for Q2 are going to suggest something of an improvement. They, I think, are going to take us a bit further up. Q2 was a good quarter for productivity, and of course uh, that makes us all want to hope that uh, we're over the worst, but uh, we had a false dawn here in 2011, 2012, so while the improvement in productivity that's you know, embedded in the Q2 figures is very welcome, I think it's too early to infer from that that we are now out of the wood. The second point I would mention is that this is done using today's data. The ONS 
is in the new blue book going to revise the GDP figures. Those figures aren't available in quarterly terms. There have been indications of what they're likely to show. And what I expect is that over this period, they will show that output had grown faster than currently thought by about 0.4% per annum. And of course, without any revision to labour input, and I'm not expecting any revision to labour input because labour input is measured using the labour force survey and the cent you know, based on the census, and there isn't any new, in that's not to say labour input is correctly measured, there isn't any new information to come. But uh, so anyway, we're going to get a revision to output and we're therefore also going to get an improvement in the productivity picture. But uh, while you know, we might find ourselves getting up to about here on the graph, uh, no, that's still very disappointing compared with what we had seen in the period before. So while the ONS data are going to imply an improvement in the productivity position, a slight diminution of the productivity puzzle, I think that uh, it's unlikely that they will imply, well, I know from what we've been told in advance, they certainly won't show the productivity puzzle as going away. So what are the possible explanations of the productivity puzzle? Well, there have been quite a lot of them, and of course they aren't necessarily exclusive. It could certainly be coming from a bit of this, a bit of that, a bit of one thing, a bit of something else. So one couldn't or wouldn't expect to say that it was definitely item one and not item two. Anyway, what are they? Well, labour hoarding. This is a traditional phenomenon that explains low productivity during recessions. The idea is that businesses know there are costs to hiring and firing, or rather firing and hiring. If you have staff who are used to your business, they're likely to be more productive than new staff, people who haven't got used to what you're, you know, what you're up to. So if you have a temporary period of weakness, it makes a lot of sense to hang on to your staff rather than you know, get rid of them and then recruit new people when things improve. That's a traditional phenomenon during recessions, although actually it wasn't observed terribly strongly in the recession of the early 1980s or indeed the recession of the later 1980s. But certainly what we saw was that unemployment went up appreciably less than many of us had expected during the contraction of 2008, 2009, it stayed below the 3 million mark. So labour hoarding, one possible explanation. Another explanation, misallocation of capital. Now, this is an argument that, based on the argument that the financial crisis was very disruptive, that what people had valued before the crisis, they didn't value nearly as much after the crisis. Essentially, we found we had got too much capital in things like new shopping centres and not enough capital in the businesses which were perhaps going to be really productive after the crisis. So, in some sense, finding you've got your capital in the wrong place is a bit like discovering that you haven't got nearly as much capital as you had thought. To give an extreme example of this, it's not uh, relevant to the British case except as an illustration. In both 
the Irish Republic and in Spain, a lot of capital investment was put into building housing. In the Irish Republic, there were these famous stories of sort of houses or areas of housing, essentially in resorts in the countryside with golf courses and the discovery that no one wanted to buy them and that uh, no, essentially they weren't worth what people had thought they were going to be worth. If you like, you can say that's misallocating your capital or you could say that instead of productive investment taking place, actually in the period before the crisis, you had had what's turned out to be wasteful investment. So this misallocation of capital certainly is an argument that uh, I think uh, some people gave some weight to. What about capital labour substitution? Well, this is sort of you know, a slight, giving a slightly different role to capital. The argument was that in the period after the crisis, wages were held down. Essentially, labour was replacing capital, and so overall productivity performance was relatively poor. And in principle, it's a mechanism that might work. Number four, a shift towards lower skilled jobs. Well, this was an argument which was made in the aftermath of the recession, 2009-2010. Actually then, when you looked at the data, it seemed that the increase in employment was managers and people with degrees, in other words, highly skilled people, or skilled people, highly skilled people being recruited rather than low skilled people being recruited. Of course, they may still have been doing non-graduate jobs. Uh, but anyway, if we look no, further, no, over the whole period that's built up since the crisis, it does look as though there has been some shift towards lower skilled jobs uh, and you know, recently the increase in employment has been among relatively you know, lower skilled people. My colleague Ben Broadbent talked about that last week. Uh, then perhaps you know, we have another you know, couple of thoughts which merit some discussion. One is that there has been less investment in research and development for economies to grow or output per person to grow, you either need more capital or you need better ways of doing things. And uh, this is saying that there has been less investment in developing better ways of doing things. Then the last point is in some sense closely related to point number five that uh, it's not so much the development of the new ways of doing things, but the implementation of better techniques that has rather lagged. And no, why are these different things? Well, if you think of a, I don't know, a very simple question going back, or point going back to where I started, if you think of the no situation, Britain is quite a lot less productive than the United States. Thir no, their productivity is 31% higher than ours, according to the, now this might not be quite the most up-to-date data, but certainly the data that were published in the Treasury document on productivity. And uh, no, so why don't we just use their methods of doing things and end up being much more productive. Well, one explanation, it's not a, I mean, it's perhaps the best you can do for one reason or another, there are obstacles to implementing the new te newest technologies. We can't use them. Possibly heavy costs are involved here in implementing them, or perhaps also there has been a lack of willingness for people to make the investment effort which is needed 
actually to implement the latest technology. Uh, I suppose I ought also to mention a couple of other points which are you know, material to some extent. One is that the output of North Sea oil has been declining. Now, North Sea oil by its nature doesn't employ very many people. The output is measured as what you can get out of the ground. A decline in North Sea oil output has a perceptible impact on productivity, but it doesn't account for a large part of it. A second issue is the uh, performance of the financial services industry. Now, here there is a significant measurement problem. How do you measure the volume of output of financial services? Well, no one has an easy answer to that. What the ONS were doing were taking the total volume of bank accounts, i.e. the value of bank accounts adjusted for changes in prices, and when you have a banking crisis, then essentially the banks contract. You have much less in bank accounts overall, but whether that is genuinely a loss in output is something that uh, I think people can reasonably question. Uh, another issue connected with the financial services industry, they of course have been having to invest heavily in compliance issues and uh, dealing with uh, you know, mis-selling of insurance and so on. Well, you can say that that's you know, some people might say that that's regulation which is limiting the productivity of the industry, but a perfectly reasonable rejoinder to it is that the output of the industry was overstated before the crisis <coughs> because people didn't allow for the costs of correcting the mis-selling. No, that came afterwards, but it was actually a consequence of the way people behaved before the crisis and as to the more general question <coughs> of financial regulation limiting productivity, well, the purpose of regulation is to stop people doing things that they would otherwise do. And, uh, well, we know what it was like when the financial services industry wasn't tightly regulated. <coughs> so anyway, there is quite a range of issues, explanations, as to what might have been going on, and I would like to say a bit about uh, some of them. But I think perhaps the most important, no, perhaps a good starting point is to look at it in an international context. Here, the red line is the, uh, sorry, the mauve line is the United States, the blue line is the United Kingdom, France is green, Germany is yellow, and so on. And you can see that in Italy, the dotted line, productivity has been stagnant for quite a while. But in France, Germany, the United States, and the United Kingdom, to a greater or lesser extent, we have all had productivity slowdowns in the period after the crisis. In the United States, the slowdown has been less marked than in the United Kingdom, and in particular, it came after 2010, rather than starting at the time of the crisis in 2008. Uh, no. In France, productivity hasn't done too badly, but the economy has stagnated because you know, unemployed, as unemployment has risen in Germany, well, productivity growth has been weak compared with the performance before the crisis, even though that was relatively weaker than Britain. The one star performer has been Spain, the red line. And in the period before the crisis, the Spaniards used to say, used to say yes, they had a problem with productivity and uh, they didn't know what to do about it. Since the 
crisis, productivity in Spain has accelerated very sharply. Now, I don't have a good explanation of the reasons for this. In the early part of the adjustment, it was said that Spain, because of this housing boom, had got a very high, low productivity construction sector. And as that shrank, so productivity in the economy started to rise rapidly. Well, whether Spain is now starting to catch the productivity slowdown, if you just look 2013 to 2014, I am not really sure, but uh, <clears throat> no, as far as we can tell, Spain remains something of an anomaly. How much of an anomaly? Sorry. What I have plotted on this graph is labour productivity growth in the period 2000 to 2007, and then on the vertical axis, productivity growth in the period 2010 to 2014. So for each of these blobs, which represents an advanced economy, one of the, advanced, the OECD's members, for each of these blobs, you can see how it performed after the crisis compared with how it performed before the crisis. And this dotted line here is a 45 degree line. So if productivity growth had been the same after the crisis as it was before the crisis, you would be on the 45 degree line. And if some countries had done better, others had done worse, you would expect to see roughly the same number of countries on each side of the line. As it is, we see just three countries above the productivity, above the 45 degree line and 23 countries below. So if ever you feel you need a demonstration that the productivity puzzle is an international phenomenon and not just a UK phenomenon, then I think really this has to be it. Of the three countries where productivity, labour productivity performance has improved after the crisis, two of them, Poland and Australia, didn't have recessions. They were the two advanced economies which managed to avoid recessions during the crisis. And the third is Spain. So, no, the United Kingdom is shown as this red triangle, and you can see that with these data, these are the OECD data, our position was actually bad even compared with the norm. This line here is the regression line, so that tells you, you know, where the average country would be expected to be. That said, with the data revisions that are coming up, what I expect is that the United Kingdom will end up just about here. So those data revisions will take our performance from being unusually bad among the advanced economies to being about average among the advanced economies. In other words, nearly everyone has got a productivity puzzle, and with the new GDP data, when they emerge, the productivity puzzle in the United Kingdom will be broadly similar to that in other advanced economies. Well, am I able to... Sorry. Am I able to say any more about the factors that... Uh, explain the productivity puzzle. Well, I have tried you know, a number of you know, regression equations. Uh, the dependent variable is productivity growth 2011 to 2000. Well, when I say 2011 to 2013, those are the growth rates. 
So it's actually growth from starting in 2010 to 2013. And you can see that the high productivity countries had a significant uh, disadvantage. Spain had a significant advantage. It stands out as an outlier that uh, being a euro area member no, had a marginal negative impact, but it wasn't something that was significant. If I try and look at uh, no performance taking account of the experience during the recession, in other words, what GDP growth was during the recession and what productivity growth was during the recession, then I find that... Uh, having you know, good growth, not being too badly affected by the recession, helped your productivity growth afterwards, and so too did having reasonably good productivity growth during the period. So really all I can find from this is that uh, you know, the more countries were affected by the recession, the bigger seems to be their productivity puzzle and once we allow for that then even Spain's performance becomes uh, in, no, not, not statistically significant. Being a Euro area member had possibly a marginal negative impact but not something that uh, we could say is significant. And you no, know, the size of the financial sector, the degree of openness, well, they seem to have delivered three noughts in a row. So those sorts of structural variables don't seem to be terribly material. So that suggests that, uh, you know, apart from performance during the recession, perhaps there isn't very much that we can say on the matter. Let me try and go a bit further. This chart shows economic growth for five Western countries. And what I've done here is to look at overall growth. So overall growth has three components to it. One is the contribution from capital. Now, the contribution from capital would be very low if you weren't investing because you were relying on labour. The second is the contribution from labour input. And then the third is total factor productivity. This is the residual component of growth which isn't explained by labour input and isn't explained by capital input. And you can see that uh, the United Kingdom had quite strong total factor productivity growth, residual productivity growth. That's what comes from doing things better. We had strong total factor productivity growth in that period, but it has been negative since in 2008 to 2010 and on these data up to 2013. If you look at the other countries, you can see that uh, total factor productivity growth, well, in France there was a bad spell during the recession, in Germany a bad spell during the recession, the Netherlands a bad spell during the recession, but in the United States it held up. Uh, since then, total factor productivity growth, residual productivity growth has been positive in France and Germany, negative in the Netherlands and the UK, and positive in the United States. But what you can also see from this is that capital has gone on making a positive contribution to growth throughout the period. And that means I really think I have to reject the idea that uh, a substantial component of the slowdown in overall productivity comes from a material weakening of 
the contribution from capital. You can see if you look at the United Kingdom, here we had a chunk of about 0.8, here it's about 0.5. Well, if we were talking only of a 0.3 percentage point shortfall in productivity growth, we wouldn't be nearly as alarmed. So I think we want to reject the idea that uh, it is, no, or we want, I mean, that's not to say that capital has no effect, but I think I'd want to reject the idea that it's mainly to do with labour displacing capital. Of course, no, labour hoarding was something else that I mentioned. Well, you can see that in the United Kingdom, but not only in the United Kingdom, labour input has grown very sharply since 2011. Now, if people were hoarding labour, then as the economy expanded, they wouldn't be rushing to increase employment. So, essentially, the buoyancy in employment that we have seen, that you can also see in the United States, suggests that at least in those two countries, labour hoarding hasn't been terribly material. You could make a case that actually maybe people are still hoarding labour on the continent, but I suppose I find it very odd that as a response to a shock that happened seven years ago, people would still be holding on to labour that they didn't really need because of the costs of hiring and firing. So if I were to think back towards uh, no, the list I had, I think labour hoarding really can't be a terribly important explanation. No, it may have been in the first year or so, but it's unlikely to be a material explanation by now. Misallocation of capital, well, that's difficult to show on this sort of diagram, but the reason I have always had problems with this explanation is that if you have industries with too much capital where productivity, sorry, where profitability is as a consequence low and you have other industries where there's too little capital where, productiv where profitability is as a consequence high then what you would expect to happen over the seven years since the crisis is that investment would be high in the capital scarce industries and investment would be low in the capital glut industries. And as that happened, as that process took place, you would get faster than normal productivity growth because you would be offsetting the misallocation of capital. To explain the productivity slowdown in terms of a misallocation of capital, you need to be saying not only that something went wrong at the time of the crisis, but that it has gone on going wrong. In other words, normal market forces haven't really been working. Now, it was suggested that there were obstacles to setting up new businesses, that in that sense the capital market wasn't working. Uh, in fact, and that this was an explanation of low productivity, in fact, what some colleagues of mine from the National Institute, Rebecca Riley and Gary Young, well, Gary's also a colleague at the Bank of England, what they found is that the productivity of new businesses in the first year or two tends to be lower than average. And this, of course, is what you would expect a lot of businesses fail in their first year, so when they're set up, you get those that aren't going to be successful as well as those that are. But what they also found was that productivity in existing businesses had declined very sharply during the recession and hadn't really recovered afterwards. Now, you can still make an argument that some of those existing businesses should have gone bankrupt and didn't, 
but uh, certainly even looking at those data for individual firms, it is a bit difficult to argue that uh, there is an inherent problem arising from the misallocation of capital. So what about an unwillingness to spend on research and development? Well, what you <coughs> find both in the United Kingdom and in the United States is that the one form of spending that has held up is research and development spending. When business investment was weak, research and development spending wasn't weak. Now, some of the work I read on that suggests that, uh, no, or is based on the assumption that there's a fairly clear flow from research and development spending to new ways of doing things and better technologies. I must say I find it a bit hard to imagine either that technical improvement comes only from research and development spending or that there is a clear and linear progression from research and development spending to, techn no, to new technologies. After all, we can all remember these famous new technologies that haven't really worked as well as uh, people have hoped. I suppose the classic has been the fusion reactor, but uh, it's uh, certainly not the only one. Nevertheless, there have been a number of papers suggesting that uh, actually what we need to think about as an influence on technical progress on this blue chunk are you know, the costs of adopting new ideas, the barriers to adopting new ideas, and uh, the ease with which new ideas can be adopted. And perhaps the you know, that can be best shown by looking at this graph, which is labour productivity in the G7, the large advanced economies, measured relative to the United States, which was, you no know, has a value of 100 throughout. So you can see that the only country which briefly caught up with the United States was France in the early part of this century. But more generally, you can see that, you no, know, with the exception of Canada, which was level pegging, the other countries have tended to move towards the United States. But since about 1990, or slightly later in the case of the United Kingdom, they have tended to stagnate and then sometimes to fall back relative to the United States. Now, if the United States has these wonderful technologies, why aren't we employing them? And, as I say, it's a bit difficult to put your finger on it, but I think the best explanations are that, for some reasons, there are obstacles to adopting new technologies. People have looked at measures of economic openness, openness to foreign direct investment, and found that that is related to technical progress. They have looked at uh, uh, no product market regulation and found that that has been related to technical progress. Uh, an interesting paper by Nancy Stokey, she was looking at developing countries rather than advanced economies, but she suggested that sometimes, you know, if they developed barriers to import, importing the latest technology, perhaps because of vested interests, then they would try and catch up by investing more in human capital in education, and the consequence of that work is that it's possible to see investment in education as a bit of a second best to investment in taking on the latest technology. Uh, well, where does that get us 
for the period I'm particularly interested in, 2010 to 2014. There have been a couple of papers recently, uh, one by Bianchi and Kung, another by you know, a long list of authors including Mark Gertler, which have suggested that not only in other countries, but also in the United States, in the aftermath of the crisis, people have seen more barriers to the adoption of new technologies. And you can think of reasons why that might be the case. In the period after the crisis, business investment was low. If people are unwilling to undertake business investment, they may also be unwilling to put the effort, take the risks, in adopting new technologies. So you might expect to see some sort of co-movement between investment, uh, I'm, I'm not saying a perfect correlation, you might expect to see some sort of co-movement between investment, uh, which leads to the, the green bars, the contribution from capital, and uh, total factor productivity. Now, if that is the case, and I must say, I see that, sorry, I'm, if that is the case, and I must say, I see that as perhaps, no, the most plausible explanation of the majority of the crisis, of the productivity puzzle, if that is the case, then as business confidence improves, you might expect to see an, improve, an increase in the take-up of new technologies and therefore some sort of revival in productivity growth. And you might also think that uh, that is particularly material for the European economies because they have this gap relative to the United States. On the other hand, the fact that they reached this plateau you know, in the 1990s to 2000s perhaps shouldn't give us too much confidence that that's the case. I certainly wouldn't interpret the sharp improvement in Q2 of this year as being a sudden enthusiasm for taking on new technologies. There are random fluctuations and you always get random fluctuations. But I must say, I think the basis for the uh, no, relatively optimistic view that there is going to be a revival in productivity growth, though that can be you know, supported by the argument that as businesses become less nervous, as economic conditions become more normal again, so businesses will be more willing to take on new technologies. And while I am certainly not going to put you know, a number or a time to it, I do think on those grounds we can hope to see some sort of improvement in productivity performance and possibly the numbers we have seen in the first part of this year are beginning of that. Well, thank you. I'm very happy to take questions now. Okay.